gratitude for connection. Well, aloha, happy Father's Day, you guys. Today I got a great word of encouragement for you from the book of Romans, chapter 13. You're not going to want to miss this, so grab your Bibles out. Get ready as I'm Pastor Izzy from Amazing Grace here in Kona, Hawaii. And I've had the privilege of sharing God's word for, I don't know, about 40 years. So I got some insights I hope you'll enjoy on this Father's Day. Things to help you uh, just do fathering better for you dads. And for the kids, Lord, if they can take these words to heart, they'll do even better than us. Hopefully they'll excel past us and be even better parents in their time to come. So today we're going to look at a scripture that gives great instruction as we continue from the words of Paul to the church at Rome. In chapter 13, he says in verse 8, this is the beginning of a paragraph where he says, Owe nothing to anyone, he says, except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, he says, you've heard, you, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you should not steal, you should not covet. If there's any other commandment, he said, it is summed up in this saying, that you should love your neighbor as what? As yourself. And this is truly the fulfillment of the law. You know, with all the different rules, people always ask me, what's the rules? If, I, if I'm going to be one of these Christians, I want to know the rules going in. And then they start asking me about the Ten Commandments. You know, that's in fact what Paul's quoting here. Different commandments, don't commit adultery, don't commit murder, don't steal, don't covet. Those are all part of the Ten Commandments. But the first four of the Ten Commandments, the tablet, you remember in, in, when Moses came down from the mountain, there was two tablets of stone. And in English, I always saw them with five commandments on one side and five on the other. In Hebrew... You read from right to left, and the right, the, the tablet would be on their right, that where they'd start, is has four commandments, and the tablet on the left has six in Hebrew. And the first four have to do with your relationship between you and God, and guess what the other six have to do with? Your relationship between you and other people. So, you should not commit murder, you should not covet, you should not steal, you should not lie. They're all on this side over here of the of the commandments and the ones that say you should have no other god before you because god says i'm a jealous god i want the best for you i want to be your heavenly father and i want to show you dads how to be a great dad yourselves those are on this side and he says you should make no idols don't worship any other god those kind of things they're over here and so paul is saying if you want to fulfill all the commandments they're summed up in one saying now he wasn't making up something new he didn't come up with this on his own. I mean, Jesus taught this when he was on the earth. And you remember in Matthew chapter 22, there was a, a lawyer who was, you know, they're known for knowing the law. He came to Jesus to test him, it says in verse 35 to 40. And he asked him, what is the greatest commandment in the law? I want to know what's the greatest commandment. And the sister passage of that is found in Luke. And I want you to turn with me to, to the sister passage. It reads almost the same, except it adds in a little extra. Now, Luke chapter 10, if you'll turn there with me, I'll show you something that, that gets tagged on. Luke put it in, and I'm really grateful that he did. In verse 25, we read this same story. It says here, it says, um, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and began to put Jesus to the test. He said, Teacher, Rabbi, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's a great question. What do you have to do to inherit everlasting life? And Jesus answered him with a question. He said, well, what's written in the law? How does it read to you? You're an attorney. Tell me, what, what do you think you should do? It's funny how sometimes when people ask a teacher a question, they think the teacher has to spit the answer straight back at them. Sometimes as a teacher, the best tool we can use is a question back and ask back, what do you think? You know, sometimes, by the way, when you're sharing the gospel, you might, you know, feel compelled. You've got to tell them the answer. Just Maybe ask them, what do you think the answer is? Because listen to what he comes up with. It's really good. He answers, he says, um, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is great because here he is quoting from Leviticus 19, verse 18, and also in Deuteronomy, you know, we read it in chapter 6, verse 5, this very verse. I mean, this is from the Old Testament law. You love the Lord with all your being, and the second is like unto the first. You love your neighbor as what? Well, you see it right there, right? As yourself. So Jesus answers him. He says, 
You answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Boy, the, he doesn't overcomplicate it at all, does he? He just says, okay, you got it. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as, like the same. Love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you'll do great. You'll have everlasting life. Now, some guys want me to make it more complicated, but Jesus didn't. And But verse 29, listen to this <laughs> look, true typical lawyer. Can you just picture this? In, I, well, if you know any... I, I think of some of the friends I have back east. They would come They would come up with an answer just like this. It says, Wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, verse 29, And who is my neighbor? Like, hmm, you know, like, I want to know who I have to love. Do I have to love, you know, like, just the guy next door? Or So Jesus says, I'll give you the answer. Now listen to this answer, and it's actually going to be a story that ends with a question, not a statement. Watch how he does this. Back with another question to this same guy, this attorney. Jesus says, I'll tell you a story. He says, uh, there was a certain man that was going down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell amongst the robbers and they stripped him and they beat him and they went off leaving him half dead. Now this is interesting. From Jericho, it says Jerusalem to Jericho, there's this valley. And, and it's referred to affectionately as the, the valley of the shadow of death or the valley of the thieves. There's a St. George's Monastery that's tucked up in the wall. There's a deep ravine. And the, the to stay cool in the desert there, you'd walk down in the ravine. The problem is all the crooks have the vantage point up above you. They can see you down below. And they can have their signal to their friends up ahead. And they can ambush you down in there. And this was a this was a place that was typically known of as the place you don't want to travel alone. This very valley. that, that And Jesus picks this irrelevant place, you know, like, Hey, this guy was traveling through some bad neighborhood, a place known for where you get you get beat up and robbed, and this is what happened to him. They beat him, they stripped him, and they left him for half dead. They robbed him. Verse thirty one says, "But by certain chance, there was a priest who was going down that very road, and he saw him, and it says he passed by on the other side. Likewise came a Levite. That's the tribe that the Levitical priest." were you know taken from they were the ones they had to draw the straws for taking the time of responsibility to do the tabernacle services and so this tribe of levi that was dedicated to the service of the lord a levite one of them came by and he saw the man and it says and he passed by on the other side he didn't go over and help him but verse 33 jesus says but a certain samaritan who was on a journey came upon him and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and he bandaged him up. Uh, uh, he bandaged up his wounds. He poured oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast. And he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, two days wages. And he said to the innkeeper, here, take this, take care of this man. And whatever more that you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Jesus is, Jesus is telling him, okay, this is the guy that helped. Now you might say, well, what's the big deal? So is this Samaritan guy helped him. But if you're not, you might remember the story when Jesus went to the well and he was, uh, he was there in John chapter four. Let me just turn you real quick to that. Um, Jesus goes and there's a woman that's there. And Jesus, he, he says to her, um, when they came to Samaria, Jesus said to the woman, give me a drink of water, verse seven of chapter four. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman therefore said to Jesus, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan? And, and for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God that was, who was asking you for a drink, you'd, you, you would ask me, you, or you would say to me, Give me a drink, that kind of living water that you would not have to ever thirst again. You would, you would have that everlasting living water given to you. And she said, well, sir, you don't have anything to draw with. And this well is deep. Where do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? And, and uh, that gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons. And Jesus said, everyone that drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst. And that water that I should give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life and she says sir give me this water please you know and, and and he says go call your husband and come and she said i don't 
uh, I don't really have a husband. And he said, you answered well, because you've had five husbands and the one that you're with now, he's not really your husband. And this you have said truly. And she goes, I perceive you're a prophet. And so she went and got the guys from town, brought them to hear Jesus. And they listened to Jesus after her telling this testimony. She, they're like, she's like, I heard this man and, and, and you guys got to come check him out. And after they heard Jesus speak, the Samaritans began to, to believe in Jesus. And you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the Samaritans, they're in Jewish culture. Were the Jews allowed to marry outside of their outside of their Jewish heritage? They were told not to, right? And in 721 BC, the Assyrian nation, they were bad, bad dudes. They were known for just being captors that tormented their their, their captured people and they they chop off the big toes of the men and they would they would uh, humiliate them they would strip them and put a hook down in their private area and hook a chain and parade them around and 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 make them march all the way back to Assyria and most of the guys would die along the way the ones that lived suffered great humiliation and shame they'd have their thumbs cut off and the Syrians were not guy, nice guys when they came in they attacked Ephraim one of the tribes there in the right right across the the river there the Jordan they attacked the Ephraimites uh, and when they did they took the men and they brutalized them and, and drug them away into captivity and to humiliate the women they went in and they slept with the women and the women wound up being with child and those children were half Assyrian half your enemy not bad and you know insult to injury you not only do they have kids but kids that are that are half-breed in the Jewish culture with the enemy. And that's the Samaritan group. And so Jesus, I love how Jesus is telling the story. He went, he went to Samaria. By the way, the gospel is to the Samaritans just as much as to the Jews. But it says here, when, he, when Paul is writing, the, or I mean, sorry, when Jesus is uh, telling the story to the, to the attorney here in Luke's gospel, you'll see that he says, the guy who helped the man that fell into the robber's hands was a Samaritan. He wasn't even a, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a Levite. Wasn't one of the good guys. He was a half-breed. And this half-breed went and took care of the guy. He gave the innkeeper two days wages, said, here, take care of the guy. I'll, I'll pay you anything extra it costs. Don't worry. I got it covered when I return. You just take care of this guy that, that fell into the hands of robbers. And then let's listen to what Jesus says to this attorney. Now, if he's tell, tell them a story about a Samaritan helping a poor man falling into the hands of robbers. He said to, G, to, the, to the attorney, verse 36 of Luke chapter 10, which of these three, the Samaritan, the Levite, or, or the priest, he said, which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Didn't tell him, he just said, which one? Listen to the answer, verse 37. The attorney said in verse 37, the one who showed mercy toward him, that's the one who proved to be a neighbor. Now remember, he was trying to be justified. Who's my neighbor? Jesus then answers him. He says, yep. He says, go and do the same. Go and show mercy. The same as, as you know that that guy showed mercy, even though he would be considered the enemy or the half-breed, or the undesirable, the, the one that even the woman was shocked Jesus was talking to her because she was a Samaritan and he was a Jew. Jesus said, it's not about that. It's about showing mercy. On this Father's Day, I mean, there's nothing better as fathers than that we be men that demonstrate and live mercy. And we, and we live this very verse about, about fulfilling the, all the law, all the rules, with simply loving our neighbor as ourselves. If we want to set a good example for our kids, we actually have to live this. You, can't, you can talk it all you want, but if you don't show love in practical ways, I mean, right now with everything crazy going on in our nation, what if everybody quit the crazy and started loving their neighbor as themselves? Now, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, what, what kind of stuff do you want done for you? Is e this is the easiest, most simple teaching, I think, but the one everybody doesn't, they're like, don't talk about that yet, Pastor, because you're, you're stepping on my spiritual toes. You know, I, I, I want to be mad. I want to go do harm to that person. I want to do this. Don't do that. 
The Bible's we, we went over this before. Vengeance is whose? Mine. Mine, says the Lord, not yours. It belongs to the Lord. Leave room for the wrath of God against the injustices. But make more room in your heart for love. And the kind of love I'm talking about is the kind where you love your neighbor as yourself. Because that's the true answer. That's the, that's the thing that it's summed up. Paul wrote, it is, it is summed up in this very saying. The whole thing summed up. All the law, love your neighbor as yourself. For love, verse 10, I'm back here in Romans 12, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. That's the thing that fulfills the law is when we love the way he wants us to love. Now, a little extra credit here in, in the Old Testament. And since it's Father's Day, I gotta I gotta throw this in. You know, it says in the Proverbs it's a it's a great joy for a dad when his son does uprightly. I, I sent that verse to my son this week because he always is aspiring to do right and and it makes me proud, you know. It's a great thing to have a son that wants to do what's right in the sight of the Lord. But dads, we got some words from the Lord that come from the book of Deuteronomy. And in chapter 11 of, of Deuteronomy, I'm going to end with this p passage today on Father's Day because there's some, there's some things that we're told as parents we ought to do, especially as fathers. Listen to this. It says, it, comes, it, it shall come about that if you listen o obediently to my commandments, this is uh, Deuteronomy 11.13. If you listen to my commandments uh, uh, obediently, which I'm commanding you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. You know what it says is going to happen? Then I'll give you rain for your land in its season, early and late rains. You may gather in your grain and your new wine, your oils. I'll give you grass for the fields of your cattle, and you shall eat and be satisfied. You, in other words, I'm in a, God says, I'm in a blessing. They were agricultural society. He says, you want to, be, you want to really be blessed? You keep my commandments. You love me with all your heart. You, lo you, you love me with all your soul. And I will give you the rains in, the, in, in your lands in the right times. The early rain, the latter rain. I'll make your crops to, to prosper. They didn't have irrigation system, guys. This was counting on God for who's in control of the rain. But God says, I'll take care of you. And then he gives them a warning. Beware, lest your heart be deceived and you turn away and serve other gods or worship them. Because then you get the anger of the Lord. You get, you get a bad thing that's going to happen to you. I'll dry up the grounds and you won't get anything in and, and it will, it'll become a, well, a, a clue that you should turn back. But then it goes on and tells us we're to impress these words of God on our hearts and on our souls. He, he even says in verse 18, you should bind them as a sign on your hand, on the frontals of your forehead, and you should teach them to your sons. Talking of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk along the road, when you, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So how often should I talk about the commands of the Lord with my kids? All the time. Yeah, pretty much covers it, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, from the time you get up, you know, when you, when, when you, when you rise, when you lie down, when you walk along the, the, the roadside with them, uh, when you sit in your house, you pretty much got it covered. I should teach my kids the things of the Lord and impress on them these things into their hearts and their minds. And, and he even says they, they were to bind them on their hands. On, if you ever seen the Jewish people where they wrap this black thing around their arm with a, with a little uh, written scripture and a little box, a flak tree, they call it, on the forehead. And they're saying, we're putting God's word right in the forehead. I don't take it in the literal sense of hook a box to my head. But I want to put his word in my head because I believe that when I got it at the front of my mind, if I got it at the thing I'm thinking about, his word, I'll do a lot better as a father. I'll have these words there right when I need them. And it, and it promises blessings unto us. And he says, and you should write his word on the doorposts of your house and on the gates so that your days and the days of your sons may be multiplied in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. You get a blessing, not just to you, but to your children. He says, you know, write, write God's word on the doorposts as you go in the lintel of your house. You know, it, it's something about, 
you know, it's a lot easier to remember if every time you pass under a doorway, there's a verse like written over the top. You might think, well, I don't really pay attention to that. I, it's there all the time. But if you've ever lived in a place where God's word is displayed like that, and then someone says to you, hey, what was above the door? You know, and you passed under it every day. Guess what happens as you pass under it every day? Your, your, your mind, you don't have to work really hard to remember it because somehow there's just a connection. Oh, yeah, the front door, there was a verse about this. Or there's a, and the Jews take this to heart. We don't really do it so much in our culture. I wish we did. You know, just put the verse right there, uh, right above the doorway, right on the doorpost, you know. But they have the gates where they go into the house, you know, from the yard. They, they have it like a front gate. They would put them right on the gate. God's word, so that it was a way to help impress his word into our minds and to get it to stick with us. But it's not just the role of the doorway to say what God's word is or the, or the you know, fence post, and that's going to get it into you. No, dads, we have to give it to our children. We have to tell them when they lie down. You know, they're going to bed. That's a great time, by the way, to tell them God's word is when you, bedtime, you know, bedtime stories. You're like, what should I read them? Read them God's word. Tell them things about God. Tell them the great promises he gives. If you obey him, how he will prosper you, how he'll bless you, how he'll make your life to be satisfied in you obeying him. If you don't obey him, are you allowed to tell your kids, hey, bad stuff happens if you don't obey? Yes. Sure, that's part of the same words that he gives. But you got to tell them. When do you tell them? When they get up. When they lie down, when you go for a walk with them, when you're when when you're just in your house sitting around, you want to really improve house dynamics in in this culture we're living in. Start speaking to your kids about the things of God, and if you don't know what to tell them, just sum it up. Go to the most important thing. Hey, guys, I want you to know, and I'm so glad I got my kids here. Well, Joy's not here yet, but she she might be watching online. But I want to tell you, kids, love God. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And make sure you love your neighbor as yourself. Love them. And that includes, it's like unto the first, it says in another passage. Like unto, that means likened. Just like the first one, you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You won't go wrong. God will bring blessings into your life that you will be satisfied. And a lot of this kookiness and crazy stuff that people are doing right now, that would fall away if we would return to this. So dads, let's help the next generation get this into their minds. That they, we, kids don't overcomplicate. We're just going to follow Jesus' example. Sum it up. Just love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the word I have for you today on this Father's Day. I don't, I'm trying to keep it short so that it can sink in and you can carry it with you. Take it with you. Now, next week, we'll continue looking at the scriptures. I got some more cool things to share with you. So come back next week. If you don't mind, um, I'm going to try to put, start putting these things up on YouTube. We're going to try to reach more people than we reach right now. We're, we're grateful for the ones of you that are sharing this through Facebook. Thanks to all you guys that are watching, Brenda and Dawn and, and uh, Cindy, all you guys. We love you. And um, happy Father's Day to all you dads out there that are watching. I just say from a dad to, an, to all you dads, may the Lord bless you this day and may you be able to do what I said today. Just God will help you sum it up. Just sum it up and tell your kids to love him and love your neighbor as yourself. Have a blessed day. Aloha.